10 years ago it was 350 people in sweaty set of conference rooms in um, Scottsdale. We had no idea whether it would be successful, but we were off to the races after that. Today, 10 years later, we take a very large convention hotel in San Diego and fill it with 5,000 people. We have effectively a 10-ring circus going at all times. Even with that size, it continues to be a very personal kind of family gathering. This is a great collection of people from every walk. Educators and funders and entrepreneurs. Everybody comes to the ASU GSV Summit because everybody comes to the ASU GSV Summit. It is a magnificent opportunity to get real business done in one place. A lot of the summit takes place in the hallways. We've created a lot of deals and partnerships that originated at the summit. You have these serendipitous, unplanned interactions. I'm always meeting people that give me new ideas. You get to hear from a whole bunch of different people that might give you an opportunity to think about things from a different point of view. The ASU GSV Summit is interested in workforce transformation. Education is the only solution that will help our civilization thrive in a future of work. It will be the surest path to opportunity and a provident life. We're trying to help people realize their greatest potential. ASU GSV is a community unlike any other. It's sort of one of those circle the calendar, must attend events. I wouldn't miss the ASU GSV Summit for the world. It's ever changing and evolving. I would reschedule my wedding to attend the ASU GSV Summit. 10. 10. 10 years. Wow. 10 years. 10 years. Amazing. 10 years. 10 years. <laughs>
very quickly, but human capabilities are a linear path. And so how do we bend that arc of human potential so human, everybody can participate in the future is a fundamental objective of ours. As Bill Gates said, most people overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in 10 years. If you look what's happened in the last 10 years, then you fast forward to the next 10 years, I think we're going to have amazing things that we're going to be able to accomplish. So if you look back 10 years ago, the first ASU GSB Summit, there was 35 companies that presented. We had 300 attendees all in a sweaty conference room at Sky Song at Arizona State University. This year, we have 350 presenting companies, 5,000 attendees. If you look at the, yeah, that's, not only is that a record, but also sold out. Look at venture capital investment in the sector. Uh, in 2010, $700 million was invested in venture capital and education and talent. And we thought that was pretty great. Look at it last year, $7 billion was invested in the sector with investors recognizing the importance of this area. There's now eight unicorns in the education and talent space. That's private companies with a billion dollars or greater market value. Tal Education in 2010 had one billion dollar market value. Today, it's a 21 billion dollar market value company, the largest education company in the world. Workday in 2010 was private. Today, the market value is 41 billion dollars. 2U, which made a huge announcement this morning with Trilogy, hey, Google. <laughs> Private company in 2010, just two years old, today $4 billion market cap. Chegg, 2010 was private, $4 billion market cap today. Pluralsight was private in 2010, and yes, their market cap today is also $4 billion. VIP Kid wasn't even born yet in 2010. Its last financing was at $3 billion valuation. MOOCs didn't exist in 2010. There's now over 100 million people on MOOC platforms. So you go backwards, and you look at the circle of life 500 years ago. Basically, your life and where you lived, where you died, was within five miles of where you were born. Effectively, your parents' past was your future. Then this wave of innovation came, really connecting the world, making it a smaller place. The Gutenberg Press in 1439, we had the steamboat in 1756, the locomotive engine in 1804, telephone in 1876, automobile in 1886, then Wilbur and Orville Wright with the, with the airplane in 1903. And this really launched us into the American century. And the American century was really symbolized by the American dream. This American dream was that people came from all over the world with the hopes that their future was going to be uh, better than their parents, and their kids' future was going to be better than yours. What Ronald Reagan said is you can go to live in France, but you cannot become a Frenchman. You can go live in Germany or Turkey or Japan, but you cannot become a German, uh, a Turk, or a Japanese. But anyone from any corner of the earth can come to America and become an American. And that was really the spirit of the American dream. The American century was characterized by a standard of living uh, symbolized by GDP per capita growth of 4x for the first 75 years. Education attainment was up 13-fold by 1975, which made the US leaders in the world for high school attainment and third in the world in college attainment. There was a 15-fold increase in innovation and entrepreneurship evidenced by increasing annual patents Immigration increased 6x during the American century. All while inequality fell by 50% from 1900 to 1975. So if you look what the American century was all about, it was a soaring opportunity with this plummeting inequality. Old MacDonald had a point, E-I-E-I-O. The ingredients for the American century in this prosperity was about education, innovation, entrepreneurship, immigration, and opportunity. Then came the 1980s with the PC revolution and the information age was born. Companies like Apple, Microsoft, Dell, and Intel became commonplace, you know, known by everybody. 1990s, globalization was catalyzed by the fall of the wall in 1989. 
this saw this booming economy around the world, which resulted in the middle class going from a billion people in 1990 to 3.2 billion people today. Venture capital basically didn't exist outside the United States in 1990. Last year, 55% of all venture capital was outside the United States, what we call the global Silicon Valley. So the internet age really came into its own during the 2000s. Pe people kind of forget in 2000 when the internet bubble burst, there was just 300 million people on the internet. Today, there's nearly 4 billion. And Steve Case, the CEO of America Online, had a major, uh, was a major player in that movement. And Steve will be uh, on Wednesday keynote with J.D. Vance. So the world really did become flat. 2010, you had mobile phones, everything becoming on demand. And so this all uh, contributed to this incredible wave of innovation that took place uh, over the past 40 years. Looking at the 10 largest market cap companies in the world, seven of them are technology companies. And what's amazing of those seven technology companies, none of them existed 50 years ago. So this boom in technology, this boom that's gone on in innovation, is nothing short of breathtaking. At the same time, ironically, since 1980, the income of the lower 50% of Americans is flat, yet the top 10% of Americans' income is up twofold, the top 1% is up 3x, and the 0.001% is up 7x. It's truly become a winner-take-all economy. You can see CEO salaries today are 361 times the average worker. The top 10% uh, population controls 90% of the wealth. Amazingly, the eight richest people in the world have as much wealth as the bottom half of the population on Earth. It works in sports this way, too. This is Mike Trout. You might have seen a couple weeks ago. He signed a $430 million contract. And this is where he fails his job more than two out of three times. <laughs> Internet is all about winner take all. In fact, digital, we, we say, stands for disproportionate gain to leader. And you want to see how this works, look at social media with Facebook. So Facebook, the number one social media company in the world, $500 billion market value. The number two social media company, MySpace, was bought by News Corp for $500 million. The number three company in social media, Friendster, was hijacked by a bunch of Filipino housewives for nothing. So as Aristotle said, inequality is the parent of revolution. And it's not a new phenomena that elites were basically have clueless to what was going on with regular people. You might remember Marie Antoinette famously said, let them eat cake. And that didn't work out so well for her. More recently, Ken Griffin, the hedge fund manager, bought a pita terror in New York City for $238 million, basically saying, let them eat cake. And this is in a, in a society where basically people have pitchforks. And so you see things like Occupy Wall Street, Black Lights Matter. Pope Francis said the church is radically resolved by rejecting the absolute autonomy of markets and financial speculation by attacking the structural cause of inequality. And you've got to remember that 50.1% wins the vote in a democracy. And you're seeing populism soar in the United States, certainly with President Trump, with Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders as, as examples. But this is not a United States phenomenon. This is a global phenomenon where populists have basically won major elections around the world over the last 12 months. The sister of populism is socialism. This is AOC on the cover of The Economist a month or two ago. And it, this article talked about how uh, millennials are essentially embracing socialism as an alternative to the normal, uh, to, to, to the world world of capitalism. In fact, 51% of young people feel positive about socialism. So Margaret Thatcher said, the trouble with socialism is that eventually you run out of other people's money. <laughs> and that's true, but it also misses a point that says, you know, that the young people basically see what's going on, they see a system that's not working, they, they think the game is fixed, and they want, a different, they, they want an alternative, and that makes sense. But it's not just the inequality of wealth, it's also the inequality of health. So this is a recent 
article in the Wall Street Journal talked about US life expectancy falls further. And when you get into the substance of the article, what it basically shows is that you, know, you have two Americas. So wealthy Americans, wealthy male Americans, actually have the highest living expectancy in the world, but the, lo the lowest income Americans basically have the same living expectancy as a male in Sudan. So the world, on average, is getting healthier, wealthier, and wiser, but the future is not equally distributed. And so looking at in the United States in 2000, 50%, when you look at households with, a, with 50 or 50 percent or more of the households uh, were low income, four states in the United States in 2000 actually had that dynamic, which is remarkable when you think about you know, the most prosperous country in the world, or 50 percent of a household in the state would actually be, be categorized as poor. Well, today it's 20 states, and if you take that to 40 percent, it's 39 states. So if you come from a low-income household, you're five times more likely to drop out of high school. You're eight times more likely to go to prison. 80% of the US prison population is from high school dropouts. Looking at SAT scores, which is the golden ticket to the most prestigious schools, there's a direct correlation between your family household income and your SAT scores. So what the SAT does the best job of predicting is how wealthy your family is. Now with the admission scandal, actually what it's likely to predict is who, which parents are going to jail, but that's different. <laughs> if you look at the top, most prestigious, most competitive schools, 75% of the students come from the top quartile families, household incomes. And when you look at the bottom quartile households, you just have an 8% chance of graduating from any college. We all know there's a direct correlation between your level of educational attainment and your income. So you add this all up, and if you were born poor, you have a 70% chance of staying poor, which this American dream has basically become a myth. The college admissions director at Harvard has basically become the gatekeeper to the future and when you look at the fact that 10% of all Fortune 500 companies went to an Ivy League school, and 30% of US senators went to an Ivy League school, 100% of the Supreme Court justices went to an Ivy League school, and the last five presidents went to an Ivy League school. So basically, we're creating a modern caste system, and we've come full circle. Your future is determined by how well you select your parents. And that's, and, and that's just a fundamental problem that's, that, that's an issue that we need to fix. So as we think about bending the arc of human potential, we have an issue that we're dealing with, which is basically people's unhappiness. Happiness, unhappiness is, or happiness is plummeting. And that's all part of how we, and we're going to bend the arc for human potential. So some statistics around happiness and meaning and purpose. So psychology today says that the average four-year-old laughs 300 times a day. By the time you get to 40 years old, <laughs> at least I made you laugh. That's good. It's four times. So and this isn't very funny. So the US suicide rates are up 30% in the last 20 years. Teenage suicide is up 70% in the last decade. Opioid deaths are up 45% in the last year. Teenage depression is up 50%, and one in three children have an anxiety disorder by age 18. So experts have a lot of different reasons they think this is happening. But one thing for sure is this always-on society that we have with mobile devices is contributing to it. So look at the statistics with this. The average time spent on a mobile device has gone from 20 minutes a day in 2008 to over three hours a day today. The average 10-year-old spends eight hours a day with media. Only one in 10 kids plays outside daily. At a Boston elementary school, third graders were asked to design the perfect playground. And what they came up with was a playground that looked pretty normal, but there was a sign at the front of it that said, no cell phone use. So, these, these nine-year-olds have figured out um, that maybe something is, is wrong with this, 
and that's just something to address. You look at the number one class at Yale in terms of popularity, it's happiness class. The number one class at Harvard is happiness class. So you got the best and the brightest students, yet they're seeking something, they, they know something's missing. And so back to this American dream and your future being better than your parents and your kids of future being better than yours, people aren't buying it. And that's showing up in the fertility rates. So basically, since 1960, the United States fertility is cut by more than half. Effectively, the United States is dying. So Beyonce said, a life of money making is one undertaken under compulsion and wealth is evidently not the good we are seeking for it's merely useful for the sake of something else. Actually, that wasn't Beyonce, that was Aristotle too. <laughs> but I didn't want the whole speech to be Aristotle, so. <laughs> but look at what's happened with this varsity blues um, tragedy. And so you got some of the wealthiest parents um, imaginable, and yet they feel like they have to create a side door for their children so they can have the kind of future that they, they, they want for them, as, as, as backwards as that logic is. Our friend Artie Duncan said, so your kid is already born on third base and you feel like you have to steal home for them, which is just a great quote. This issue uh, is particularly close to home for me. This is Sacred Heart School in Atherton, California, where, th where three of the 33 families that were involved in this varsity blue scandal, kids went to school. My two daughters graduated from Sacred Heart. I actually coached in flag football one of the girls that was involved in the scandal. This is a great school with great families, yet this is the kind of situation that's been created. It's, it's, it's tragic. So well, we got J.D. Vance here on Wednesday, and this kind of culture in crisis is not just for the Appalachian Mountains. You know, Atherton, California is the wealthiest zip code in the United States, and yet this, these kind of issues are taking place there and everywhere. Technology is contributing to this anxiousness, um, and the things I fear what artificial intelligence is going to do to their jobs and obsolescence of career. This is Key G. He is the number one Go player in the world. And he was, in 2017, destroyed by AlphaGo in a Go match. Just stunning people that follow this kind of thing. And that already, on top of the fact that you see different studies that shows as much as 50% of jobs are at risk of being replaced in the next 20 years, and that has people concerned about their future. Then you see things like what technology is doing, and people see these amazing you know, things that you couldn't imagine a robot or technology doing, and not only impressed, but they're also scared and amazed. But the, but the strange thing is humans have been able to do amazing things for a long time. <laughs> and people are amazed by what cats can do and nobody's worried about a cat taking away jobs. <laughs> so a horse that can count to 10 is a remarkable horse, but it's not a remarkable mathematician. And I think we gotta think about how technology is going to complement our future, not replace it. We also look at the positive side that's estimated that $15.7 trillion is gonna be added to the global economy by 2030. And so to put that in context, that's larger than the Chinese economy. So autonomous vehicles are really interesting because again, it's sort of this evidence of this future that people have trouble imagining. But you look at a societal good that's gonna be created from this. 1.3 million people die around the world every year in car accidents. And it's estimated that autonomous vehicles are gonna reduce that by 90%. So if you've been in an autonomous car, what you, what you realize is the car is not replacing the driver. The driver, the, the, the driver and, the, and the car are operating in concert, making it a much more safe experience. And I think as we think about that and think about the education world, if you have three bad teachers in a row, you're statistically dead. And so we don't think technology would or should replace teachers. It won't. What it's going to do is complement teachers, we think, and help them be more effective and focus on the things they want to do. And it's estimated to be able to spend 90% more time on active learning in the classroom. We think that's a really great thing. So in thinking about the future and how we bend the arc 
for human potential and, these, and, these, and the inequality that exists and the unhappiness that is, is present. And finally, I mean, we need to think of some of these structural issues that we need to tackle. And so first, just looking at kind of the way it works, prog processing, progressing through the system. So the class of 2019, high school class that's graduated in the spring, has four million high school students. 83% of them uh, will graduate, which is the highest number, and credit Artie Duncan, um, I might be in the audience, um, for having a big, big, big uh, catalyst for that. So that gives you three million high school graduates. Of those, 70% will go to college, which gives you two million to enroll in college. Of those, 43% will drop out, so that leaves you with a million graduates. So I like to think of this as 4321. Yet, so we got 33% of the US adult population has a college degree or better. And I appreciate for the mathematicians in the audience that it actually works out to 25%. But the third number is 33%, it's just easy to remember 4321. But of the 33%, <laughs> and you round up, you round down. Anyway, of the 33% of the US adults, the, the issue is that 65% of the jobs today and tomorrow require a college degree. So we have that structural mismatch. We have a structural mismatch with, between the fact that the degree you're getting is gonna be basically obs obsolete by the time you get your, it starts getting obsolete as you get your diploma. Looking at the cost is a structural problem. The cost of education in college has gone around 4x inflation for the past 40 years. College debts, $1.5 trillion, that's larger than the credit card industry. The average college student has $37,000 of college debt. That's, it's, just, it's, it's kind of mind-boggling. And you combine that with who's the average college student? Well, the average college student is quote-unquote non-traditional. 70% are non-traditional. So in other words, the minority has become the majority, but most college and universities are set up for 18 to 22-year-olds. Classes during the day offered twice a year through semesters, dormitory, football team, marching band, all irrelevant for over 50% of the student population. Then you think, of the, look at the structural challenges with the jobs that are being created. Here's another headline from the Wall Street Journal. There's now, there's more job openings that, that outnumber unemployed Americans, which is a recent phenomenon. There's six million open jobs out there today, and it's estimated globally by 2030, there's gonna be 600 million new jobs that are being created. The problem is, it's, it's the jobs aren't uh, aligned with what people know or the skills that they're developing. So we have to change that. So smart people like Mark Zuckerberg say you, know, you should be a programmer or engineer because basically he'll hire any smart person with those skills he can find today. And I think that's, that's clearly true. What I fear about that, though, is that ultimately um, supply will meet demand. And what I, what I fear is that, that the computer programmer of today, which is a high paying, you know, in demand job, becomes basically the sweatshop of yesteryear. And so thinking about the skills that you need for the future, it's like the, the general fighting in the last war. You gotta really think ahead of where things are going and what, you know, what are the kind of things that you need to know to stay relevant on an ongoing basis. So my good friend and hero, uh, Bill Milliken, who we honored here a few years back for a lifetime achievement, uh, makes, makes the comment about STEM. To fix STEM, you need to start at the root, and I think that's a really great place to, 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 to start. Albert Einstein said, if everybody, everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it's stupid. And I think that's an important idea to have in mind when people are thinking about you know, where they pursue their ambition and talent and, and skills. We also need to get academics out of the ivory tower and into the real world. Arizona State has been a leader in creating that. What I like to say is education is to peanut butter as work is to jelly. And when you put them together, it's just a beautiful sandwich. Or another way to look at it is we call it these network effects between matching talent and connecting it to work through education and learning. And we think that's you know, fundamentally where the future is in terms of structure and alignment. Talk about this old system that was created just over 100 years ago where you played from zero to five, you learned from five to 25, you had a job from 25 to 65, and then you retired. The new world we're in, you're gonna learn from the time you're born to the time you retire, if you ever retire. 
And going back to health care again, if somebody asked you if you were healthy, you said, yeah, I'm healthy. I ran a marathon 30 years ago. You'd say that person was crazy. But, you know, so the person today is going to have to continue to be training their brain and retrain their brain to stay relevant in a dynamic, changing world. And so I think the foundation in terms of what you need to know and the skills you need to develop that will stay relevant and remain relevant in this world and how we bend the arc of, of, of human potential is what I call the seven C's that you use to navigate this new changing world. The first C being critical thinking, the second being creativity, the third, communication, fourth, cultural fluency, fifth, civic engagement, sixth, collaboration, and the seventh, character. So four years ago, we wrote a white paper called 2020 Vision, which put together kind of our playbook for how we were going to accomplish this goal of having everybody have an equal opportunity to participate in the future. In that, we had 10 signposts that we called them that we thought were the critical to, to reach this goal. So as we look at the next 10 years, we've, we've looked at those 10 and we've modified them somewhat. But uh, early childhood remains a key focus. And one of the things that's exciting is we look at these 10 megatrends, these 10 focus areas. And in early childhood, we're seeing amazing innovation take place. We know that a dollar invested in preschool, um, pre-K, pre pre results in a $7 return. We're seeing companies at the conference like Wonder School, which is reimagining pre-K pre education. We also have Sesame Street here on Wednesday celebrating their 50th year, which is exciting for anybody who had Big Bird as an idol as I did. Invisible thinking uh, is the number two mega trend. And this is really the idea that you're learning by doing things you're doing naturally, that you want to do. So games is an example of this. There's 2.6 billion people that play games, up from 100 million in 1995. Also, esports is this emerging phenomenon. 300 million esports participants by 2020. We had an esports tournament here over the weekend, which was just fascinating. So Dana Husted is presented at the conference on Wednesday. She's the first female e director, esport athletic director, and just an amazing story. Just for me, learning number three. This is the combination of adaptive technology with diagnostic technology creating this individualized, personalized experience. Squirrel AI is a company at the summit that is doing exactly this for in, the in the tutoring market. Knowledge as a currency is an important theme. And this is the idea that your degree, which is the, was the previous currency for opportunity, is not being replaced, but it's being complemented by other ways that you're representing your knowledge or what you know through your knowledge portfolio. So DeGreed is a, a leader in this area, has over 200 enterprise clients, such as Bank of America and MasterCard. Hollywood meets Harvard is the fifth megatrend. This is the idea that we can learn in the education world things that Hollywood's really good at, which is things like engagement and storytelling. I believe that more people have learned American history from Hamilton than they've learned from textbooks. This Nearpod acquisition of vocabulary today is a great example of this. Sixth is English as the world language. The race is over, English won, well, you know, and it's, I feel kind of bad as the only language I speak being English, being able to say this, but you look around the world and what's happened is people are learning English because that's the way the world and business is, is communicating. In fact, there's two billion English speakers by next year, up from a billion just 10 years ago. This is Lu Li Shu, Lu Li Shu, which has 80 million learners on its adaptive platform teaching English to Chinese. Mind, body, soul, and brain science. Uh, this, is Mark, uh, this is Mark Brackett from Yale, who's going to be here on, uh, on Wednesday as well. Platforms, using the mindset or the, or the business plan, that's what Netflix has done in entertainment, Spotify has done in music, doing in education. This is Andrew Grauer from Coursera. He's got a million subscribers on his platform, doing, doing very well. Diversity, this is the, the idea that we all know we're better when we're able to bring in different experiences, different skills, different, different uh, ways that uh, people can contribute to an organization. My college football coach, was Lou Holtz said when he came to the University of Minnesota, he said the heart and soul of the team will come from Minnesota, but we're gonna go, have to go other places to get the arms and the legs. And that was true. So Fairy God Boss, um, is a, a wonderful company 
uh, that has created a career network for women, three million women on, on, the, on the platform. Impact, and this is the idea that in the future, it's really this alignment between what kind of impact and social good you can create with the kind of economic good. And so we believe the companies that create the greatest IRR are the ones that create the greatest impact. So Coursera is an example, a great example of, of that kind of impact. 38 million learners on its platform, 77% of its students come from outside the United States. Most of those learners are, are getting the education, are getting this knowledge for free, but it has a, a, thriving, um, it has a thriving economic business. And so we think that's a great example. So as I close up, I'm going to close up with this point. So um, Adam Smith in 1776 wrote The Wealth of Nations. And in The Wealth of Nations, he talked about this concept of the invisible hand, which is aligning the alignment of individuals' behavior with economic incentives. And the overall was a social good, and this is really the foundation of capitalism. In that same year, uh, Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, and in the, this Declaration of Independence, he talked about this inalienable right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So George Washington drafted off that concept in his inauguration address and really talked about a different type of invisible hand, that where the people were motivated by a higher purpose and meaning. He called it providence. So when you look at Adam Smith's invisible hand, we know it's broken. And so the way that I think capitalism is going to be fixed is the combination of Adam Smith's invisible hand with George Washington's invisible hand. And together, I think that's the future and how we bend the arc of human potential. So we look at this, we create human skills and learning efficiency along with happiness, meaning, purpose, and that's how we're going to bend the arc. We know that education is life's original accelerator. And so as we think about this kind of uh, in a way that we combine the two, is we're going to find, um, discover meaning through learning. We're going to be fulfilled through purpose, uh, through work. And together, we'll create a new invisible hand that we call the health of nations, because it's really this health of nations is going to be created by marrying that, that pursuit of meaning and purpose through learning and earning. And it's going to make the difference not only for an individual, but for a company and for a country. And so this health of nations and bending the arc of human potential is, 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 is here. So over the next 10 years, I know there's a number of people in this room that are going to be aligned with this mission. And we think that's going to be transformative, not only for the companies, but for society overall. Victor Hugo said, nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Well, I'm here to tell you um, it, this idea uh, as time has come. Thank you very much. Very much appreciate it. going on out here? There's a lot of smoke out here. <laughs> well, good evening. Um, my name is Jesse Willie Wilson. I'm the CEO and President of Dreambox Learning. And when Deborah Quazzo asked me to introduce Reed Hastings, I said, great, it would be an honor. And then I thought about it, and I said, how do you in introduce somebody, especially here, that everybody already knows? Maybe some of you have even seen him speak here a few times. And those who don't know him, know of him. And I thought, wow, what do I say? So I'm going to use some notes, if you don't mind. Most of you might know him as an education reform philanthropist, a technology inter innovator, and chairman and CEO of Netflix, a multi-billion dollar global enterprise that most of us have intimate relationships with at home. <laughs> I think the only thing my dear husband Dave isn't 100% honest with me about is when he cheats on viewing episodes of Netflix's Dear White People or Seven Seconds when I'm away from home 
or traveling for work. Netflix is testing marriages. <laughs> When I think of Reed Hastings, I think of a values-based leader who was an early investor in Dreambox Learning. When it was not much of a company, it was more of an idea. And it was at a time when no one, even folks here in this setting, understood what intelligent, adaptive technology was or could do in their learning environment. It was just an idea. Reed saw our promise, and when things were challenging, he helped us see past impediments toward possibilities. He helped me, as a leader, keep the long run in clear sight, and he encouraged me, prodded me sometimes, to intentionally cultivate a culture that would attract the best hearts and the best minds to this work. When I think of Reed Hastings, I think of an exceptional humanitarian who spent some of his early formative years in Africa in the Peace Corps and who knows firsthand what it means to be the other. When I think of Reed Hastings, I think of somebody who really taught me the importance of compassionate leadership, of authentic leadership, and of courageous leadership. When I say courageous, I mean saying when you make a mistake, owning it, and letting others understand that that's part of learning. There would be no dream box if we didn't have mistakes to analyze, yet we haven't really figured out a way, even in the most innovative companies, to encourage people to learn from mistakes. So I could tell you many, many stories about this amazing human being. But you really came to, speak, to hear from Reed. So please join me in welcoming Reed Hastings. How many people here have seen Richard Madden in The Bodyguard? Ooh, medium, okay. Natasha Leone in Russian Doll. Yeah, a little more for that. Uh, how about Kevin Costner and Highwaymen? A little bit. Okay, I would say this audience needs some remedial education when it comes to the fun of life. You're also serious, capitalists serving the general good. Well, I'm going to spend a few of my minutes as a citizen talking about education, and then a few as CEO talking about entertainment and the incredible journey we've had. So first, as a citizen, I first fell in love with Roy Romer. He was superintendent in Los Angeles, former governor of Colorado, and head of the Democratic Governors Association, so a, a very sophisticated politician. He came in in 2000 with a great plan. Many of us rallied around him and funded his work. And he did some great stuff, regional superintendents, each one with about 80 schools of Los Angeles, then 700, so that they could really be close to picking the, soup, the principals. Uh, he put in formative assessment, uh, teacher training and leadership, all of the key building blocks of building an excellent district. And slowly the scores and the reading and the math, everything was coming together. But after six years, He didn't, no longer had four votes out of seven on his school board. He was gone. New guy comes in. Guess what the new school board had run on? What does any politician run on? Change. So his programs were out. New guy's programs were in. Scores regressed to the norm. So I puzzled on this lesson, which was heartbreaking, not only you know, for me as a philanthropist, but for the kids and for overall progress in LAUSD. And I started learning more about, you know, the roots of public education. And lo and behold, we were not the first generation to try to improve our public schools. And you go back 1892, about 125 years ago, and there was the Committee of Ten. And the Committee of Ten 
you know, led by Charles Eliot, the president of Harvard University, this August group to set out the high school curriculum and on and on. These commissions come every 10, 20 years, nation at risk. All these things happen and not a lot changes. And so I started wondering, what, what is it that's really, oh, I know, it's funding. The funding's so inequitable. The funding is so low. If we can just fix the funding, then in fact we can have the great American public education that we want where every kid gets an opportunity for an excellent education. But then you look and you see, you know, there's a number of cities in the Northeast funded at over $20,000 a student, Newark, Camden, many others. And their results are not spectacular. And then there's some of the low-funded states like Utah with quite solid results. And in fact, there's a very thin, if any, correlation so far between the funding level. And so, while I believe in more funding and I've worked for more funding, that's clearly not the, the, the panacea. Oh, it's unions! Everybody knows unions are the problem. Well, if unions were the problem, then the Deep South would have amazing schools, and the Northeast, like Massachusetts, would have terrible schools. But in fact, it's the opposite. If you actually believe in data, you would say unions help schools. So it's not really the unions. Tenure, that's the problem. Everybody knows what a ridiculous institution tenure is. If we just fix tenure, then we're going to have the greatest public schools in the world. But universities have tenure, and they do okay. And law firms have tenure, and they do okay. And some states have very minimal tenure, and they don't do any better. So that's not tenure. Accountability. That's the problem. We don't have enough accountability. Let's get some test scores, and let's find out the low-performing schools, and let's find out where there's big gaps, and let's hold those schools accountable. Let's close the school. Oh, we can't do that. The kids need to go to some school, so we can't close it. Let's give them more money. Oh, that's the new kind of accountability. So the whole accountability movement doesn't really work because when a school's in trouble, we can't really close it, so we give it more money and resources. And the reward, is financially, is at least if you have low performance. Accountability's not much of a winner there. Um, leadership. Oh, yeah, maybe. Oh, well, that's kind of interesting. Hmm. You know, Roy Romer was not an anomaly. In fact, if you look over the last 30 years, there have been 12 superintendents in LA Unified. Well, you got a couple hundred thousand employees at schools, as you know. It's a service business. You've got to manage, recruit, motivate, develop thousands of teachers to do well for kids. It's a large-scale service business. Many of you have run those. And you've got to have steady discipline. You've got to have systems. And I thought, wow, what if this average school superintendent lasted three years? Well, of course, that's what's true, not only in LA Unified, in our large urban school districts in America for the last 50 years, the average tenure of a superintendent is three years. And I thought, wow, imagine if all the organizations that the people in this room ran had a new CEO every three years. Jessie's been doing her job for 10 years, and she's building momentum, just getting started. I've been doing mine for 21, just getting started. And in fact, those long runs is when you really make progress because you can develop all the supporting systems around. So why in school districts, at least large school districts, do we have rapid turnover? Well, that's because you run on change as a politician. And the school boards are elected publicly. And when there's a new majority, they want to change things. And so this cycle of new people elected to a school board, change superintendent, and change direction. It's not enough to you know, bring in a new superintendent to do the same things as the last guy. That doesn't make sense, so you've got to have a new theory of change. And that flip-flopping from the old theory to the new theory is at the root of the problem. So why don't you see that in a suburban community? In a suburban community, generally, you've got a homogeneous electorate, 
and low electoral intensity if you measure an election by how much money people spend to get elected to school board, the low intensity, it becomes very genial, and you do continue the people, the methods of the past, because it hasn't been a hard-fought election. In LA Unified, with these short tenures, a school board election raises $2 million now for a school board. So the higher the electoral intensity, the more draw for change, the faster the superintendents turn over, and the more chaotic and just sort of limping along the system is. So we're trapped in this cycle where good people try to run for school board, they mean well, they change the superintendent, they believe in the new direction, as well as in three years, the next person believes in that new change again. And so if you think about it, if we're going to continue to have superintendents change every three years, there is no way for our large urban districts to find a direction and steadily work at it to improve teacher effectiveness year after year after year, which is a steady discipline business. So what are we going to do about it? Well, that's where nonprofit governance comes in. So most of you are in either for-profits or non-profits, and they work very similarly. How do you recruit new board members? Where you look for someone who's independent, a good thinker, will challenge you some, but also believes in the general direction that you're doing. That's called a self-perpetuating board. Now what happens with a self-perpetuating board is you got on the board, to continue to make the organization a little bit healthier. Sometimes you change leaders, but you change on the same direction. You're not changing to let's go in a whole new direction because you didn't have to fight to get elected. Now, it turns out that self-perpetuating governance is a long understood form of governance. The Pope chooses the Cardinals, the Cardinals choose the Pope, okay? And you can say, well, look where that's got the Catholic Church. But that's very temporary. They're in a setback right now, okay? But they've seen much worse than this, and it's 2,000 years that they've been running. So you gotta give them a lot of credit. It's an impressive organizational structure, okay? So this cycle is for-profits, non-profits. Now think about the military branches. The generals pick the new generals, okay? It's a self-perpetuating form of governance. So this self-perpetuating, abstract thing called governance is actually critically important. So I've been on the board of KIPP Charter Schools for a little over a decade. Uh, we've had a great CEO, Richard Bart. Um, eventually, we'll replace him. And we'll replace him with someone who's following the same ethos. He's been very successful. KIPP now is over 200 schools, 100,000 kids getting a great education every day. And the advantage is with nonprofit governance, we're bringing on new people that can help KIPP get even better without the electoral context. So this is why I'm so passionate about the importance of nonprofit governance and the way to evolve there is to grow the charter movement year by year by year. Now, well, thank you. Thank you to the, for the charter movement, but we are having some setbacks. A large number of the new Democratic electorate believes in Medicare for all. So Medicare for all is we're going to close all the health insurers. Those nonprofit Blue Cross guys, awful. Okay, the for-profits, awful. We're going to close all those, and the government's going to run the entire system. And this has the grip the emotional grip of large parts of the democratic base. So there's been a big shift towards government over corporations. That's eh, a nonprofit. It's still got the word corporation in it. Okay, so this is a significant trend that's affecting, obviously, the healthcare debate. And in blue states, it's affecting charter schools. And the tide for now is turned against them. So we're fighting to hold on. You know, some states we will, some states there'll be setbacks. Massachusetts, we can't uh, get rid of the cap. We may have some other states. Interestingly, in red states, uh, they've rolled out the red carpet, the charter movement's progressing, and so we're making great progress for America, but in a relatively concentrated set of um, states. 
So we'll see where that evolves. But I, what I wanted to do is walk through with you this theory of governance is why it enables the conditions. And so what we, it's not that every nonprofit or every charter school is going to be great. We know of many that don't work very well. But the great ones can get better and better every year. What I have seen in my 10 years at KIPP is how much better they are now at 200 schools than when I joined the board at 30 schools. Because as they get bigger, they've been able to do more R&D, more professional development, uh, more thoughtful curriculum, all the things that you get in the benefits of scale. And again, it's long-term stable leadership that's essential. I know the charter path looks hard. It looks like a long challenge to change American public, edu public education. But there's not a shorter path that we know of. If we could fix the schools we have, for sure, that is the best way. But when we look at the three-year turnover that's been the past 50 years and will be the next 50 years of our large school districts, then under a system that turns over those school districts, we're not going to see any tremendous change that turns over the superintendents. That's the fundamental root cause of the wobble and the lack of execution, despite many, many great people who work in school districts. Those same people who work in school districts, if they weren't in a stable, well-run nonprofit, uh, they would contribute at enormous levels and steadily grow and improve what is what this is about. Now, it may seem like a long journey, but people change slowly. If you think about simple things, like one person, one vote, pretty obvious idea, right? You know, uh, Locke and all those people in the 1500s were muttering about that, one person, one vote, and didn't really get very far until the American Revolution. And suddenly, in one time, boom, we had it. Democracy. Only it was only landed white males who could vote. And it took our country 50 more years until Andrew Jackson to allow poor, unlanded white males to vote. And then another 50 years to the Civil War for African-American men nominally to be able to vote. And then another 50 years until the 16th Amendment to allow women to vote. And then another 50 years for civil rights and African-Americans to be able to vote in practice. So a very simple idea, like one person, one vote, takes our country 250 years to evolve on. So recognize that the stakes we're up against, things are going to move slowly. And against a compelling idea like one person, one vote, the nonprofit governance or charter idea has actually made tremendous progress in its first 20 years. And so if it can take off and grow faster than democracy, I'm okay with that and we will persevere ahead. So that's the serious part. That's the citizen part of the talk. And now I get to turn to Netflix. <laughs> so in Netflix, we went public at uh, a current split adjusted price of $1 uh, about 18 years ago. And now we're at $350. So remember, the big money is made after you go public. All of you that obsess about going public, it's like losing your virginity. I understand you're obsessed about it. And until you get there, you realize that's just the beginning. <laughs> then your life's journey is to learn how to be good at sex. And that's hard. And your life's journey in a company is to be a good and significant public company. It doesn't really begin until you get that initial episode over. I look forward to all of you being public. But once you are, remember, it's just the beginning. Now, I was fortunate to have many early leadership lessons, meaning I hit my head against a wall many times. Um, one of them, I was an engineer in a startup uh, about 30 years ago. It's about a 40-person startup. I was working really hard. I was like coding all night. I was an engineer. I was like, I was trying to do back-to-back -back all nighters, and I never quite made it through the second one. I would be so proud if I could do an all-nighter and no one could tell in the morning. 
uh, because, you know, I would try to look okay, but the coffee cups would tend to pile up around my, my desk. It was all open seating. And so by the, you know, like the end of three or four or five days, there was just like a series of coffee cups, and then the janitor would clean them all for me, and I'd come back in, and that would be great. And this went on for six months and eight months, and we were doing some amazing coding. And uh, one day I came in early to work, and uh, I went into the bathroom. And there was my CEO with all of my coffee cups around him, and he was washing them. And my heart dropped because I realized, oh, my God. And I said, Barry, have you been washing my coffee cups all, all, all year? And he said, yeah. And I said, why? And he said, you do so much for us, and this is the one thing I can do for you. And I was just so moved, and I felt like, wow, I would follow that guy to the ends of the earth. Unfortunately, that's where he led us. I had great personal loyalty. He led the, essentially the specking of the product. We built this amazing piece of software. A couple customers bought it. No customer ever installed it. I'd spent two years writing stuff that never got turned on. And I realized, oh, this leadership thing, you both have to be like humble and gracious, but you also have to be like strategic. You don't want to be like, <laughs> the blessed leader, and you go right into the box canyon, and everybody's dead, okay? So there's a couple uh, of these skills. Now, in my first company, which was 1991 to 1997, uh, I had the original idea. It was a software product, very technical software. Uh, our sales uh, doubled every year. Uh, it was very exciting. But I also made a, a lot of mistakes. I was an engineer, and... When you're that way, you think every time there's a mistake, I'm going to put a process in place to avoid that mistake happening again. And basically treating the company like a big semiconductor factory. You know, I'd studied semiconductor yield management, kind of the basic courses. And that was that industrial uh, orientation. And so year by year, we had more processes. Uh, and we actually reduced error with all of these processes. And we got to be very efficient. Um, we got to be, everyone followed the manual, so to speak. Some of it was written, some of it was just verbal. But it was very well regimented. And so we were really good until the market shifted. And markets always shift. In this particular case, it was C++ to Java. And the whole value system was around following the playbook. It wasn't around thinking, and of course there were some thinkers, but in general, we were stuck in our ways, even after only six years. And so what I realized, and so eventually our largest competitor acquired us. It was not a, a great outcome, but it was a good outcome still. And in hindsight, I realized it's like monoculture. I had tried to over-optimize for a particular thing, and then we had gotten very specialized and very rigid. And that flexibility is at tension with efficiency. And if you really seek efficiency, no errors, crisp execution, no wastage, then you really cramp down on flexibility, adaptability. So when I started Netflix, I realized, OK, the key is not being so narrow. In, in my first company, we did management by objective. Everybody had very specific objectives. We had bonuses pay out every six months, depending on did you meet your objectives or not. Well, the challenge with that is you get partway through a quarter or a year, and you want to shift a little bit because maybe a sales territory or maybe an engineering goal. Um, and everyone's got their MBO set that goes their comp. And so if you change them, you have to renegotiate all the comp. And all these management by objectives become like handcuffs, like concrete, that don't make you flexible. And so I realized in Netflix, oh, let's just try to tap into the human soul. Let's try not to manage, but to inspire. And so to do that, let's be very flexible. So like the comp program, no bonuses. We just have flat comp. 
Every year it gets adjusted. If you do great work, you, you know, obviously you get a raise. But we don't try to manage um, specific details. We try to lead by setting context. For me, the perfect quarter, which I have not yet had, is a quarter when I made no decisions. When all I had to do was talk about these great shows, these important things, this great market, the way Cambodia is developing for us, the way Germany is developing, how to think about pricing, and I never had to make a decision. And this whole idea that the CEO is supposed to be the micromanager or now the nanomanager, that leads to very poor long-term outcomes. The key, I think, in leadership is to step back, and when there's a mistake, don't say, oh, here's a process or here's how to fix it, but figure out what context you failed to set as leader such that a smart person could make that mistake. The whole art of modern uh, creative enterprise is around a tolerating a bunch of small mistakes so that everybody is learning and thinking. So when the big changes come in the market, you don't have the rigidity. Now, what I'm talking about applies to creative enterprises, like all of yours. If you're running an airline, I want you to have checklists and procedures. <laughs> if you are running a hospital, okay, there's a number of safety-critical businesses where you want zero errors. That's a class of the economy. This room is filled with entrepreneurs, and the way that you invent and learn is to build the toleration for errors. And so you want lots of little mistakes, you want learning episodes so that you're adaptable. Now, when we went public back at the $1, we were a $100 million DVD rental company, and Blockbuster was $5 billion, so 50 times larger than us. And so, for the next six years, we fought a head-to-head -head battle with them. And finally, thankfully, they declared bankruptcy in 2009. So, how did it work that we were able to do that? There was no single thing. We constantly were nimble, we evangelized. Many of the things that happened were not tech, you know, uh, tactics from me. It was all of us thinking about, edu I was always educating people about the customer, what customers cared about, um, various uh, ideas. And through that process, we learned and evolved. Now, no sooner than Blockbuster had disappeared that we started streaming. YouTube started in 2005. We started in 2007, but it was very nascent. Worked on Windows PCs only with uh, very little content but started to grow. And eventually, we were able to evolve into doing streaming along with DVD. And then when we expanded internationally, we were able to do just streaming. That started in 2010. And then in 2011, we started spanding, expanding into original content with House of Cards. Each of these could have been a mistake, but we had a broad system where people were felt willing to try things. In fact, in the House of Cards case, Ted Sarandos, who's been my partner on the content side at Netflix, now for almost 20 years, um, wanted to do this thing. And he, you know, he told me about, well, we're going to spend $100 million on this, um, and it's not going to come out for two years, uh, and that's about equal to our entire streaming budget at that time of 2011. Uh, and uh, I was like, okay, if that's what you think best. And honestly, I didn't see it. <clears throat> He's the one who saw this is an incredibly powerful script, um, the core Shakespearean themes will resonate, and that if we nail it, that uh, this will define us and then allow us to be, and was paying more than we wanted to, but that would allow us to attract future talent because Kevin Spacey was doing this, David Fincher was doing this, Robin Wright was doing this with some big name talent, validated the platform. Now, he was right about that. There have been other things that I've done, like the famous Quickster split that didn't work, or other things that he's done that hasn't worked. So, you know, we make a lot of small mistakes so that we learn quickly. And now, around the world, uh, we're a majority international company. We have uh, customers everywhere in the world except for China. And we're continuing to progress on that model as we expand globally. Now, some people will tell you, once you go public, 
you got to like get serious. Once you go public, you got to grow up. And I would say if you get tight, if you get rigid once you go public, you're going to go down. Okay? And what you really need to do is say, now we've got to take bigger risks. I was with uh, Jeff Bezos at the Oscars. And I said, uh, you know, so that HQ2 thing didn't work out so well. And he said, well, we'll see over time. But we're a big company. We need to have big failures. We could take a punch in the nose. And I got to get my people to fail big. I was like, that's a good perspective. I like that. Okay, so think about it as naturally as you grow, the organization is going to get conservative. So your role as leader as it grows is to push people to take risk. Their natural position will not be to take risk. You got to make it okay to take risk, and you have to evangelize what are we trying to do in the business so they're taking risks in a smart area. So it's a constant feedback loop. As an example, when we went public, many people say, no more giving out the financials. So on Thursday, I meet with our global top people uh, in a room about this big, about 800 people, and we go through all the financial numbers for the quarter, and we have it released publicly. And it's never leaked. Okay, so this idea that like, oh, what's your public? You've got to control all the numbers. I mean, there's some risk of a leak, but it is small compared to the risk of your people not feeling bought into the specialness of the organization and not feeling connected to the information. So when you balance those risks, you realize that there's a good case for being aggressive in information sharing. So we use Google Docs, but there's many systems to use, and enormous amounts of information are open for anybody to read. All the, a, a complete document on all our strategy choices, documents on the financials. So the curious-minded can just click through and read. We have very few protections. Now, someday, some of it may leak, but what we judge is the damage from such a leak is much less than the damage from compartmentalizing information as you grow. Now we're about 6,000 people around the world, and communication is even more important than it's ever been before. So my takeaway for all of you would be lean into freedom, lean into creativity, think about inspiring rather than supervising or managing, and step by step, loosen your control. Try to make fewer decisions every year. Try to set better context every year. And I think if you do so, you will experience some of what we've experienced, which is great leadership throughout the organization that's flexible, that's aligned, that cares, that's passionate. And those things will what help your enterprises grow. And if you all succeed, then education around the world will be great for everyone. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you.